Well, welcome everyone. My name is Claude Jones, founder of San Diego Tech Hub, and I am excited uh, for this topic this evening. And so, you know, there are probably some new faces on the, the call uh, this evening. So I'd like to give just a brief overview of San Diego Tech Hub and some of the things that we're about and what we're doing to execute on our mission. So what is San Diego Tech Hub? San Diego Tech Hub is a community of professionals that is focused on um, focus on investing in their hometown and willing to help connect needs to opportunities without any expectations at all. And we call our members conduits because they're connecting needs to opportunities. Uh, who we actually serve, uh, our group is made up of three distinct, you know, I guess, personas or, or, or groups. We have job seekers, entrepreneurs, and people looking to help make a difference in their communities, volunteers. The types of services that we provide to the community our job placement services, workshops and training, resources and volunteer opportunities. And so one of the things that I wanted to do right now is just quickly review some upcoming events that are happening uh, within San Diego Tech Hub, you know, for the remainder of this year that show how we're executing against our mission. So for those that are free on Thursday, September 30th, uh, as part of our Legal for Good initiative, we are partnering with Patrice Nagal, attorney at law at the uh, Fisher and Phillips. And what she's gonna be focusing on is really giving us a breakdown on understanding the vaccine mandate and how that impacts California businesses and its employees. And so a little bit about what um, she's gonna be discussing is a five-step five step action plan that businesses can follow immediately. Um, she's gonna be having an open discussion about mandating the vaccine versus encouraging others about the vaccine, looking at the pros and cons of each, and then how could you blend both and so talking about techniques um, there, and then she has a bunch of resources to provide. So sample policies, you know, for, you know, vaccine mandates or encouraging others to take the vaccine, testing protocols. She has um, accommodation forms for religious, um, medical uh, disability um, type exemptions that, that you might have and, and much, much more. So, um, you know, really excited about what Patrice is doing. So if you are a business owner or an employee that, like to under, that likes to understand how the vaccine nine date uh, might impact you, this is a session you wouldn't want to miss. Let's see some of the other things that we do getting out in the community. Uh, we have our happy hour social event. So our next one is going to be October 12th. Uh, so the invite for this most likely will be going out next week, but it's a great time to connect with other conduits within the community if you're local to San Diego. Um, six to 8.30, there'll be two dollar beers, but it's a great time. Uh, just see people, network with folks and just catch up. So if you're free, happy to join. Uh, and then we have a volunteer event coming up in November, uh, November 13th. And so uh, we're partnering with the San Diego Food Bank and this is just a great time on doing some good within the community to help address food insecurities uh, for families in need and also seniors, seniors that have been impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, the last time we did this, we had about 20 conduits come out. Great time to network, do some good. Uh, it was a really fun time. So uh, if you're interested in any of the things that I talked about and want to find more information, you can connect with us on Slack, on Meetup, Twitter. You can go to sandiegotechhub.com and under resources, we have all the different ways that you can sign up and connect with us. So we're all about doing good and, and giving back and helping each other out. Now, with that, we are going to go to our main event, and I am extremely excited to introduce to you our keynote speaker for the evening, Sean Van Tyne. Uh, he is a best-selling author and advisor. Sean has helped organizations with their strategy, operations, and processes to deliver innovative solutions to increase customer loyalty and sustainable long-term revenue. He has spoken internationally on topics such as user experience, customer experience, product innovation, and he's also an author. Uh, he's written Easy to Use 2.0, User Experience Design and Agile Environment for Enterprise Software, co-author of the Customer Experience Revolution, how companies like Apple, Amazon, and Starbucks have changed businesses forever. And he's contributor to the book, The Guide to the Product Management and Marketing Body of Knowledge. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Sean as he takes us on a journey of what innovation and design thinking are, why it's important, how to sell your ideas to leaders of your organization. 
Sean, thank you so much for joining us this evening. You are a living example of what a conduit is, sharing your knowledge and expertise with the community. And my friend, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's my pleasure to be here. So as we know, we're dealing with Zoom. So give me a moment to share my presentation. And I'm gonna make the obligatory question. Can everyone see my presentation? Yep. Well, at least Claude can, so that's good. All right, I'm just gonna dive into it. I've given this talk uh, quite a few times over the years. Um, what makes it fun for me is to be interrupted with questions. Um, so if you could please uh, ask lots of questions, keep the conversation going. So tonight, the, the three things that I want us to discuss is what is innovation really? And I think that'll be a fun little trip down different lanes. Um, what is the benefits or the return on investment for design thinking? Why do organizations do it financially? And we'll talk a little bit about some of the principles of design thinking so you can walk away from this and apply this at your own organization. So let's start with what is innovation really? Maybe a weird place to start this conversation, but I'm gonna start by talking about the economy. Back in the late 1990s, uh, Pine and Gilmore wrote a book called The Experience Economy. And back then, that believe it or not, that was a new idea, this idea that at some point experience was gonna become an important part of the economy. And the way they explained it in the book, if you haven't read the book, is they first talked about uh, a commodity economy and they used um, coffee as an example. And anyone right now on this call, if they wanted to, could go to their favorite trading platform and purchase some coffee beans as a commodity and you could trade it on the market. And you know, thanks to Starbucks, you'd get a, a return on that investment. There would definitely be a, a margin of profit on those coffee beans um, if you trade them as a commodity. But if you took those same coffee beans and you packaged them up as a goods and you sold it on a store, your profit margin is gonna be even better. So there is more money to be made by taking a commodity and packaging it and selling it as a good. But if you take that same package of coffee and you brew it in a diner and you wrap it with a service and you serve that cup of coffee, your profit margin is gonna be even greater. So taking a goods and wrapping it in a service can uh, increase the profit margin even more. But if you're Starbucks and you take coffee and you create an experience around coffee, well, now you can charge $4 for a cup of coffee. And that's exactly what Starbucks did. Starbucks took a marketplace like coffee and it elevated it to an experience. And Starbucks isn't the only one that did this. Apple did it with the phone. Netflix has done it the way we watch movies. Um, and you can think Amazon did it the way we do lots of things. Anyway, so the whole point of the book, and this is back in the 1990s, and they were looking at things like Starbucks and Disneyland and things like that. They were saying that, we're gonna be going into an experience economy and any company or organization that can elevate their product and services that, to an experience is going to trample their uh, competition. Any questions before I move on about um, the experience economy? All right. There um, is a- uh, oh, Okay. Let's see, and how- and somehow they can, oh, okay, it's just a comment, no question. Okay, right. well, we'll move on then. Because really we're gonna be talking about innovation. Okay, segue. We're gonna talk a little bit about art. This is all gonna make sense, I promise you. So art, um, and this is just a definition of art, but uh, works well for our talk. Art is the expression or application of the human creative skill and imagination usually producing something that people appreciate either for its beauty or emotional power. So that's art, put, put a tack on that one. In education, we have this thing called Bloom's Taxonomy. And if anyone here has a bachelor's or a master's in education or is an instructor of any kind, you're, you're familiar with this taxonomy. What, what Bloom was um, trying to describe is the different levels in which we cognate, the way we think about things. 
So um, at the lowest level of cognition or thinking is the ability to remember. Like, do you remember the Pythagoras theorem? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Well, that's great, you remember it, that's good. Do you understand it? It's like, oh yeah. So you take one side of a triangle and you add the other two sides, you can find the third side. That's great. Do you know how to apply it? It's like, yeah, give me a triangle and I'll show you how to do it. Great. Can you do any analysis from that and come to any kind of conclusions? Can you compare that and evaluate that and use it in some high order thinking? Or at the pinnacle of Bloom's taxonomy is what's called creative thinking and problem solving. So the highest level in education of thinking is creative thinking. Let's go back to we're talking about art and art sensibility and being creative. And then we find out in education, the highest order of thinking is creative thinking. Is everyone with me so far? Innovation. When we talk about innovation in a business sense, we talk about innovation as being this intersection between what is desirable for our target audience, what is feasible for us to deliver, and what is a viable for the business to make a profit. And at the intersection of these three things is what we call innovation. I'm sure most of you have seen this chart. I'm gonna pause again. Is there any questions about anything I've talked about around art, education, the experience economy, or innovation in business? There's some chats there. Claude, you want to uh, facilitate those? Yeah, the chats were just uh, comments, just chatter. No question. All right. So Tim Brown is the CEO and president of IDEO and probably has written like, you know, the, the book on innovation. And he explains design thinking as using this design sensibility to match people's needs with what is technology feasible and what is viable to a business strategy. Do you see the connection here between design thinking and innovation? Design thinking is the methodology behind innovation. Okay, so what is the return on investment of this? What is the benefit? Why do organizations do it? Now that we've talked a little bit about the experience economy and art and education and innovation and design thinking. Why do we do it? So Bob McDonald, who's the chairman and president of Procter & Gamble, which a lot of people don't know, is a very innovative company, probably spends more in R&D than most companies. They were actually the, the inventor of the field of, of product management, little, little factoid for you. He said that we know from history that while promotion may win quarters, innovations win decades. And this is, innovation is a different way of thinking about your business strategy. A lot of companies, you know, are thinking about winning from quarter to quarter, especially if they're a publicly traded company, and they will make sacrifices to hit those quarterly numbers, which is good for the short term, but not good for the long term. And when you're thinking about innovation, innovation is a long term play. It's about being around for decades, and then it's about winning in your marketplace for decades. Okay, so I'm going to pose a question here just to get people on their feet. What percentage of projects do you think fail? because they didn't deliver a great experience. And I want some feedback. What, what do people think? Any guesses? One, 100%. <laughs> well, no, I mean, there's, there's Apple and Google and Amazon and Netflix. I mean, there's, there are companies that are delivering a great experience, but what percentage of projects fail? Oh, we're getting all kinds of guesses. Okay. Wow. There is a lot of good guessers here. I'm looking at the, the chat right now. Well, according to Forrester Research in a 2008 um, a paper that they did, they projected that 70% of projects failed due to lack of user experience. Um, and this is the last statistic that I've seen in this. I give this talk quite a bit, so I keep on looking to see if anyone else has done any um, research on this. But 70%, that's huge, right? I mean, that's a lot more than 50%. So a lot of projects fail because they fail to deliver on the user experience. Here's, here's one of the studies that interests me the most. 
Um, this is a study done by Watermark Consulting. So back in 2007, there was a, a significant crash in the economy. And um, Watermark was, was interested to see how, if certain companies did better than others, based on if they were identified as an experienced design leader or experienced design lagger or customer experience leader or lagger. And at the time, there were three indexes they looked at. They looked at the Forrester index, they looked at the Gardner index, and they looked at the Temptkin index. And those indexes identified leaders and laggers. Um, there's a big Venn diagram uh, overlap between who they identified. And then they looked at those, those companies and they compared how well they did against the, the index, against the S&P 500 index. And what they found was um, those companies that were identified as customer experience leaders outperformed the index. And those that were identified as laggard greatly underperformed against the index. And they thought this was pretty interesting. So they did the same study again in 2008 and again in 2009 and again in 2010. In fact, they did it for 10 years. And in 10 years, the results were still the same. Those that were identified with leaders outperformed the index and those that were identified as laggers um, obviously did not fare as well. So this was even more proof that companies that put a focus on delivering a great experience um, did well um, than those that did not. In fact, not paying attention to it um, obviously greatly affected your market share. Okay, just some more numbers just for fun. Um, Forrester did a study back in 2018 pretty recently. I believe they partnered with IBM on this and looked at a bunch of com companies that were using design thinking in their company and seeing what the return on investment was. And one of the things they found that was on average, companies that were following a design thinking methodology um, saw a reduced time and requirements and, and alignment went up by 75%. And when it looked at like the cost savings of that for any minor project, the average was around 200K. And for any major project, it was around 900K of cost savings. And with better designs or understanding, it reduced the development and testing by a third, which showed in minor projects around $200 and or 200, 200K and over a million dollars for for major projects. I mean, these are significant numbers that companies were seeing. The other thing they found out is that companies that followed a design thinking methodology cut their design defects in half, reducing rework, and also a faster time to market. And you can see uh, what the savings were uh, and an increased profit for these things, sometimes more than a million dollars for a major project. So is there any questions about um, the return on investment for design thinking and why companies do this. Hey, Claude, can, can people actually chime in or is, can they only chat? They can unmute and, uh, and chime in as needed. Okay. All righty. Must have been a long day this Tuesday. All right. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the principles of design thinking. Now we've talked about what it is and the benefits of doing it. The question is, okay, that's all great. How do I do it? So to me, design thinking starts with empathy and empathy is not sympathy. It's not like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that your dog passed away. Empathy is a tool that we use in human-centered design to understand the mental model of our target audience. Um, in fact- like put I, yourself in the other person's shoes. Yes, thank you so much, Ken. Yes, walk in their moccasins. Um, I know a lot of people think this is a touchy-feely thing, but I'm gonna tell you, the scientists that are good at using empathy as a tool aren't necessarily people persons, but they're very good at getting to the mental model of their target audience. Once you understand who your target audience is, that understanding leads to insights. It's like, oh, so they care about this. Well, that's interesting. And then once you have an insight, then you can run an experiment or lots of experiments. And then from an experiment comes innovation. And in a nutshell, that's what design thinking does. 
uses empathy to gain understanding, to gain insights, to run the experiments that lead to innovation. It can look something like this. This is one design thinking framework. There's lots of them out there. You know, MIT has one, Stanford has one, uh, Yale has one, um, and so many more companies do. This is Stanford. This comes from the Stanford Design School or the D School. Uh, and this is usually the one that we see people follow the most, where it has um, five phases of empathize, which we talked about before, define, so defining who that target audience is, I ideate around solutions, build a prototype, and test it. A couple things about design thinking. The first thing is it is highly iterative, highly iterative. So you may spend some time empathizing, trying to understand who your, your target customer is, and then you'll move on to define it. And then in the process of defining it, you may have to go back and talk to them again to create more empathy. And then as you move on to IDA, you may, you may realize that, oh, well, you know, who is our audience again? And then go back. But the real, to me, the real linchpin is prototyping. Because when you build a prototype and you put it in front of a target audience, that's when you, that's where the, the, the proof is in the pudding. You may find that you have to go back to ID8 and go, hmm, none of these seem to work. Let's try some other solutions. Or you may find out through prototyping that you didn't hit the target audience at all. And you just go all the way back to square one and redefine who that target audience is. And then there's testing and then there's implementing. So understand who your target audience is, explore opportunities for that solution, and then have that solution materialize. Very iterative. Hey, in addition, you. yes. And so one, one question on that, you know, one of the things that um, is part of the software development life cycle, as we try to bring, you know, UX and research into the process, mm -hmm. sometimes the feedback is that it actually slows things down. And so while the design thinking process might be iterative, as you're plugging that into software development, you know, the, it's, it's too slow, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna miss the boat. So how, how would you, what are some techniques that could be used on sort of selling this process to like business product owners mm -hmm. um, to understand or be empathetic about the customer concerns? Well, the first thing, if you're really talking to someone who cares about business is I'd go back to those ROI slides um, and let them know about how they'll get to the market faster and they'll reduce defects uh, and they'll just have a better product. So if they care about things like getting to the market faster and delivering less defects. There's already studies that show that following the design thinking process will do that. But I think one of the, the things that you're asking about, Claude, is um, a lot of people don't come around to the design team until they're so far along in their process. It's like, oh, we just built this thing. Now, can you design it? Um, and by then, they've already lost a lot of their return on investment. So um, to do this the right way, it needs to be done early and it needs to be done often. So it's both iterative and incremental. It fits really well into an agile process. Um, an agile process is really about agile planning. So once you know what your, your iteration is gonna be, you can back plan on when you need to research and test prior to that particular deliverable. And you can do them in smaller chunks for that particular iteration. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. We can, we can do a whole nother talk on, um, UX and Agile. <laughs> okay, well, in addition to being iterative, and that's a good segue, in software, it's also cyclical. And what I mean by that is that you go around the cycle over and over again. So you have release 4.0, 5.0, 6.0, et cetera. And every time you do a release, you start by understanding and conducting research, to develop that understanding, and then combine that research and observe your users to define what they're doing. And then you explore and you ideate by creating a, a range of ideas. And then you build a prototype based on those ideas. Um, and then you test the prototype, you get feedback, and then that materializes an implementation. And then you learn again and you go back around the cycle. So in addition- Can I throw to something in? Yes, please do. Yeah, uh, it, it seems to me that this is the scientific method with just some different terminology, like ID8 would be hypothesized. 
and then you do experiments to either prove or disprove what you hypothesize. You're absolutely correct. It is, it is the scientific method. It's the scientific method with a, with a different name, right? But yeah, you're absolutely correct. It, it's about coming up with a hypothesis, um, building an experiment, and then testing that experiment. Absolutely correct, Ken. Good observation. Any other thoughts about design thinking being um, iterative and cyclical? All right. Well, to, at the, go I ahead. Claude. One question: Where where do you see as part of that that process um, where like other stakeholders get involved, like the the partners that are responsible for it? So, like when we get to the prototype phase, typically, you know, the prototype might be using some other tool that might not be transferable to like engineering code. Mm -hmm. So as we're kind of going through, um, how do we ensure that what's, what is being defined aligns with the feasibility of actually being implemented from, yeah. from an engineering standpoint? Sure, um, if I may quote myself, um, there is no technology solution until a technologist is involved in that solution. Um, and what I mean by that is um, I personally involve, and I've, I've been on. I've been in the technology organization as a UX architect. Um, it's important to have a technologist involved early in the cycle, so early, early in your in your earliest brainstorming, so that they know what's coming on. Because I'm going to tell you, in many cases, um, as you say, you're making some wireframes and you're thinking through uh, ideas and brainstorming. Uh, many times in my career. I've had a technologist, like a tech architect or a solution architect, look at what we're proposing and say, dude, we don't even need those screens because in the back end, we're already capturing this information and we can do it this way. So um, there's a lot of benefit in having uh, uh, technology architects or solution architects involved early on in the process. Um, you also get buy-in from the, the technology group if they're a part of the solution. And by the time it gets into their backlog, they're already familiar with it. And it's like, oh yeah, I remember seeing the wireframes for that or watching the usability tests for that. So um, it's also good for team building to get technology involved uh, early in the process. Thank you. Sure. Now it's a challenge. I'm not saying any of this stuff is easy, by the way. None of this stuff is easy. It's a, it's a lot of hard work. I mean, a very common expression in our field is it's hard to be easy. Um, and I think that's very true. Another great question. Any other questions about design thinking being iterative, incremental, cyclical? Okay. At the core of this whole design thinking thing, this whole human-centered design approach is the double diamond. And you may be familiar with the double diamond, but if you're not, the double diamond speaks to uh, first how we as humans um, use divergent and convergent thinking to think about problems and solutions. So let me just walk you through it. When you as a human are thinking about a problem and solving a problem, the first thing you do is you use divergent thinking to think about all the different ways that problem can manifest um, until you've reached some apex of either you've thought through all of the possibilities or you've, you've dedicated as much time as you're gonna spend uh, thinking about all the manifestations of that problem. Then you use convergent thinking to really use some kind of criteria. It's like, well, I know it could be that, but more than likely it's going to be this, and it's probably never going to be that, and that's an outlier case, until you really come down to the, the zenith of that, which is the uh, problem statement. It's like, okay, I really think I understand the problem. This is what the problem is. Then your brain does the whole thing again with divergent and convergent thinking around the solution. And now it's thinking, okay, now that I have a clear understanding of what the problem is, what are all the different ways I can solve it? And once again, you reach some, some uh, apex in your thinking, either you've exhausted all the possibilities um, or you've spent as much time thinking about it as you want to. And then once again, you converge and onto the actual solution. And you do that, of course, through some way of criteria in which you test your idea iteratively until you come up with a solution. And this is the infamous double diamond around divergent and convergent thinking around uh, problems and solutions. In design thinking, 
in the model that we're talking about. And that first diamond where you frame your problem, that is when we empathize and define, if you can think back to the um, design thinking model. And the second diamond is when we test the solution and that's when we ideate, prototype and test. And let me pause again to see if there's any questions around um, divergent and convergent thinking or the double diamond. I, I have a question around um, like the time. So one of the projects that we are work on, you know, we were pushing the idea of design thinking. We're going to start this off right, really understand the customer problem, get through this. Mm -hmm. But then I time boxed it like two weeks. And everyone was like, well, there's not enough time to actually do this in, in two weeks. So I'm curious on, you know, when, when you're stuck with a sort of a, a fixed time period to kind of get something done, but, you know, trying to get something right, like, can you, like, what's a bound, you know, for this process? And is that even realistic to enforce? Um, so when I, when I think about design, I think about there are things that you do for an agile release. Right. So let's work backwards to all the way backwards. So the, the software is released, but before it's, it's released, it obviously has to be tested and go through UAT and all that. But before you can, so before you can release it, you have to test it, or at least you should test it. Right. Before you can test it, you have to develop the code. Right. And in an agile world, you develop and test together. But before you can develop the code, someone has to provide requirements. Right. In a backlog, there has to be some requirements. Otherwise you don't know what to develop, right? Um, and this is what we don't spend enough time talking about. We don't talk about what happens before things get in the backlog. And this is, this is where, to me, this is where, you know, this is where the magic happens. Before the thing gets in the backlog, there's a whole other life cycle where someone has to um, come up with some requirements. We have to validate with the target audience. It's the right thing. We need to um, test the designs. We need to do some kind of usability testing. All of that needs to happen before it gets into the backlog. Um, and I think that's what people aren't really thinking about, um, especially developers, because developers are thinking about, oh, it starts with the backlog. I have requirements in the backlog, and then I start my, my sprint planning and my sprint. And then when I'm done with that, I go back to the backlog. What we don't spend enough talking about is that whole process on how things get in the backlog. But there are, there are frameworks like um, scale that talks about um, how things get in the backlog. And it's usually about twice the iteration time that you spend in development. So if you spend two weeks iterating in development for whatever that two week iteration is, more than likely there was four weeks of um, requirement and designing that went into that two week that is always, that's staggered incrementally uh, ahead of that. So if you can imagine in your mind that you know, development has these two week inter, inter, you know, iterations where they complete it, they go back, they start the next two weeks. But ahead of that, getting into the backlog is more like four week iterations that is ahead of that to um, get those requirements ready. And in the case of like research, research can may even be ahead of that. We sometimes refer to those as like sprint negative one or sprint negative two. And this is the time that is required to research um, so you can design and test before it goes from the backlog. And that's right. the time that people aren't planning appropriately. Doesn't it also depend on the level of innovation that you're looking to do? If you're just looking to do a little increment uh, past where we presently are, then it's not as hard as if you're trying to do something that changes the world, which could take who knows how long, right? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah those are on different timetables, right? So. Yeah. There is, um, there is a software life cycle um, and it, it has its own thing, but let's face it, outside of the software life cycle, there's all kinds of things happening, right? There's a marketing department that is, has some kind of strategy around messaging that has nothing to do with the software life cycle. Sales has its own goals and it's, it's, it's cycle on how it sells things and how they track that. Training has its thing, support, um, services, billing, these are all things that happen outside the software development life cycle that are important to the company um, to make the product. And that's what, that's what we need to think about that 
you know, design thinking isn't a part of the software development life cycle. It lives outside of that life cycle. The software development life cycle gets to benefit from design thinking and that methodology. Does that make sense? Would you uh, call it an idea development life cycle? Yeah, you know, you can put, you can put whatever kind of label on it that you want. Um, th the reality is, is that things take time and certain things are sequential and dependent on something. Like I said, you can't develop code if you don't have the requirements and something has to happen to get those requirements. And that's what we don't spend enough time talking about is the process that goes into getting the requirements in the backlog. Yeah, and I think that's where the majority of the challenges that I see uh, in my day-to-day -day work is that we don't spend a lot of time in those pre-backlog activities at all. And what tends to happen is they all happen in parallel. Um, and it, it, you know, it's, it's tough. It truly is a challenge to get people to sort of a, adopt and try to be yeah. one or N plus 10, you know, to help sure. them this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, this is an interesting argument you get in uh, with development agile is it's like, it's all iterative and happens in parallel. And it's like, oh, really? Can you release code that you're still developing? Well, no, of course not. No, you can it's sequential, right? You have to develop it and test it before you release it. Well, guess what? You need to write requirements and design it before you develop it, right? Yes, there's overlaps and there's things that iterate. Yes, that's true. But there's also things that sequentially have to happen before other things happen. And that's, you know, that's, that's part of the, the, the argument that, that you need to sell about getting, getting ahead. It's really about planning. It really comes out to, you know, being a good planner and being able to say, well, if this is the release, and we're going to do this many, you know, iterations development, then, you know, we do need to do this many iterations of requirement development before we do code development, which requires this amount of research. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. And, and again, that's still software life cycle, even product management life cycle. Oh, I know what I want to say, say about this. If you're in an experienced design group and you're reporting into technology, it's, it's almost a losing battle because they think of you as part of the software development life cycle. If you can somehow convince the powers that be that experience design actually belongs with the product group ahead of the development group, um, that will get you out of being, you know, on the wrong side of the product backlog, if you know what I mean. So there you go. Yeah. I see that happen all the time. They, they think of they think of design as part of the development process, um, and then their post product backlog, rather than being a part of the product definition, which is pre product backlog. So one of the things that you can do is shift that mindset from moving design from the technology group to the product group, and get it ahead of that. You know, even a better partner than product, believe it or not, is marketing because marketing is even ahead of product. You know, because they have to figure things out. Product gets their their, their product requirements from a business requirement, you know, and those business requirements are part of a, of a market strategy. So um, if you're an experienced designer, start talking to the marketing group, get ahead of the product group. So again, it's all about getting further upstream. So you have the amount of time that you need to do things the right way. Now you got me on my soapbox. Okay. All right. Okay. So when you're in that first diamond, and you're framing the problem, the things that you do to empathize with your target audience is you may interview them, you may um, shadow them, watch them what they do. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, contextual design, which starts with uh, contextual inquiry, which is just a fancy way of saying, watch your target audience interact with your solution, make observations and ask them questions of, hey, why you do that? And the reason you do that is because Humans are really, really bad at articulating what they do. And it's not their fault. What happens is, as a human, is if you do a task often, it becomes rote, memory, and you don't even realize that you do it and you forget why you do it. So you're doing something and it's like, oh, did you know you do that? It's like, oh my God, I didn't even realize. And why do you do that? And they usually have to pause and think about it. It's like, oh, well, I do this because of that. And that's where, to me, that's where the magic happens is in that contextual inquiry when you're observing your target audience, interacting with your solution or a competitive solution 
or you're, if you're in a blue ocean, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. And that's when a lot of the discovery and the insights happen. From that, that's when you move on and define. Based on what you learn from your contextual inquiry, you can go on to create, I like personas, um, create something like a persona when you can articulate what their objective is, what kind of decisions they're trying to make. Because at the end of the day, we want to help people make better decisions. What kind of challenges are they having? What are their pain points? Uh, what are their goals? Um, what keeps them up at night? Um, and you know what helps them sleep better? Any questions about um, how we empathize and define in the first diamond when we're framing the problem? Yeah, my, my, my comment there is just that we've, you know, my approach has always been, it's, it's good to get developers in the field, right? And, and you know, it's, it's, this is what we've been doing without knowing it or explicitly calling it that and, and seeing a lot of success there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, quite frankly, um, having been a developer myself, uh, though it might be good for a developer to observe, um, if they don't have the right human-centered design background, um, I'm not sure how useful they'd be other than an observer of watching someone work with their product. Um, they're, they're more beneficial to uh, whatever knowledge is gained to share that with them. It's like, hey, you know, we just want to let you know we just got back from, you know, uh, Wisconsin and we we're with company Z. And you know what we found out? We found out that they're not using this feature at all the way we thought they were. They're actually using it for this. They don't understand that at all. And um, so now we need to rethink it. And, you know, hopefully they, they believe you and trust you. If not, you can also shoot videos. Um, it's time consuming, but you could shoot and edit videos um, and use them as part of your report saying, hey, and look, we have some clips to show you how they struggled with this. So um, though it's important for the engineers to understand what the problem is that your audience is having, I don't, I don't think they actually have to go, they don't, they don't have to be a part of the field study. They just need to be aware of the findings. Does that make sense, John? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it does. If, if you know, I, you know, the, the, I've had lots of success with getting engineers and, and people into the field. Right. And, 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 and I think that drives a lot of innovation too, you know, or how about useful innovation, right? As yeah, yeah. To hey, if, innovation. if you can get them out there, you know, more points to you. Right. I know at, at companies like Intuit, um, every employee, including the person that sweeps the floor, has to um, be on the other side of that one-way mirror uh, whenever they're running a, a, a usability study because they think every employee should be able to empathize with uh, their target customer um, and how they use their product. So it's great if you can do it. Um, I know another company here in San Diego, uh, Mitchell, if you're familiar with it, um, they do what's called ride-alongs. Uh, and every month they invite, I think, three people in the company from any part of the company. So they could be engineers or product managers or from training or support um, to come along when they do their observations. So there's, there's lots of ways of, of involving other people in the company who aren't necessarily involved in the human-centered design process to, um, to better empathize with how your target audience is uh, using your solution. Yeah, um, we do have a question on chat. And uh, before I, I, I ask that, I do, I do um, share the same sentiments that John has. Very similar, we've brought engineers into the process on just customer interviews or even some of the um, UAT type type sessions or where they're walking through a, a prototype and using it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a very eye opening experience where they can see the struggle yeah. and um, empathize with it. So I, uh, I think that is a good, a good technique to use. I do, I do too. Just make sure that they're on the right side of the one way mirror. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you don't want them yelling at the user going, oh my God, it's so obvious. You have to push that button, right? That's right. Don't, don't want them doing that. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Uh, the question for you, man, is uh, how do we get the powers that be to recognize the need for more empathy and human design? Um, I find this to be one of the most common struggles. Yeah, yeah. So um, the powers that be are really concerned about uh, one thing, and that's finance. So if you can, if you can speak to them in their language, they're a persona, 
that you need to talk to. Um, and the thing they care about is finance. So if you can explain to them how following this process can increase revenue or reduce cost, then they will listen to you, which is why I have the slides from the various studies that show that, because that's, that's the argument you need to have with them. You need to get in front of them and just talk to them about money, right? Look, this is about finance. This is about us making more money and reducing costs. That's what this is about. And if you want to make more money and you want to reduce costs, this is a methodology that we should be implementing now so we can gain from that. And by the way, um, there are other companies that are much better at delivering experiences and they do way better than we do. And they could be eating our lunch because we live in what? An experience economy. So those are, those are the arguments that I use within an organization. Any other questions around how to sell design thinking to upper management? Okay. We have another diamond to talk about. And that's the find the solution diamond. This is the diamond which we um, ideate, prototype, and test. And these things get really blended as we talked about. So ideation just is really just a fancy way of saying brainstorming. Bringing a, a diverse group of people in a room, the greater the level of diversity, the better the ideas are gonna be. So get someone from marketing, get someone from engineering, get someone from training, get someone from services, anyone that has kind of a unique perspective uh, on the customer and what the customer's goals are. Um, and then, and then you're gonna have a, a really just great discussion. One of the keys to a successful brainstorming is something that we borrow from improv, which is this idea of yes and. So instead of having people argue about, no, it's this and that, you gotta ixnay that at the beginning. It's like the only thing you can do is add on to someone's idea. So if Joe says this, then you go, yes and this. And it's really, it's really that blend of diverse ideas where you come up with some of the best ideas. And then of course you have to prioritize them because you know, you're gonna end up with a lot of great ideas if you did it right. And then you have to decide, okay, okay, I have all these great ideas, which are really the ones that we need to do. And then that feeds into the prototype and the prototype can take all kinds of forms, wireframes, mock-ups, drawings on a napkin, uh, sketches on a whiteboard, pictures of sketches on the whiteboard, pictures of the napkins, whatever. Um, the idea though is to, be agile and to get things out there and to get them in front of people and to test them and to fail quickly and learn even faster. Um, I'm gonna tell you that from my experience, I learned a lot more from failure than I do from success. In fact, you know, I think success is almost, well, I'm not gonna say success is a bad thing, but it's not a very good teacher. Failure, failure is a great teacher. We learn from failure. Success feels good, but we learn from failure. And of course, testing, iterative testing uh, of that prototype. And, it, and it's in the testing that you, you have that engagement and that observation and a lot of the oh shit moments like, oh man, that totally made sense to us when we were brainstorming making the prototype. And now we realize it doesn't make sense to who we thought it was gonna make sense to. Gotta go back to the drawing board. So ideation, prototyping and testing to come to a solution. Any questions about the second diamond, finding a solution, brainstorming, making mock-ups, running tests. Preferably, this is all done prior to the product backlog. Okay. All right, so if there's three things that, okay, four things that I want you to uh, remember, from our little chat this evening is first, we're in an experience economy now where customer experience leaders um, outperform laggers quite significantly compared to the index. So that's a business reason of why your company should do it. Uh, number two, design thinking uses the design sensibility and methods to create innovation. So when people are talking about innovation, they're really talking about how do you how do you innovate? How do you innovate? You innovate with the design thinking methodology, which means thinking like a designer or an artist. And organizations that employ design thinking, we know there's data that sh shows that they save time and money 
and they deliver a higher quality product and services and they reach market faster, which is why your business should be doing it because they want to be to market faster and they want to deliver a better product. And quite frankly, they want to make more money. And at the end of the day, empathize, understand, experiment, and innovate. Questions? And how much time do we have, Claude, for questions? Um, we have plenty of time. So I'd okay. say we can, you know, we can probably go about uh, 10, 10 minutes. All righty. I'm ready. Shoot. You know what? I, I will just say I thank you for for sort of walking through this. I will say one of the, the hardest things that I face is the execution aspect of it. I, I feel that people understand sort of the concept of having empathy, you know, you know, kind of doing some of this thinking up front. I think you sort of hit it between this sec separation between sort of the, the requirements kind of development and really spending the time up front to do this versus kind of that code development and separating it. Yeah. The, yeah. the thing that I see is that everything is just combined because it's just, it's the time to market. And while leaders, you know, if I build a case study to say, hey, company XYZ, you know, did this and they saved all this money, trying to lift and shift that into an organization that might be dysfunctional. Um, and there's just a lot of work to just kind of align on the way of working. Like they might have to invest in just fixing their, their crap internal to the org before they can even implement the design thinking. And that investment of doing that, just they're not willing to do that, which, you know, they're bound to, to fail. And so I, I'm just wondering if you've ever encountered a company whose internal ways of working were just so jacked up that that needed to be fixed. And what was that journey look like before they could even get to implementing these design, um, the design thinking principles? Yeah, so I'll tell you something that was interesting. When um, Jeff and I were writing the customer experience revolution, um, we we're talking to folks at JD Power that um, just did a global uh, research study uh, on um, innovation and experience design and design thinking. And um, <clears throat> what they found was, and it was staggering, that um, only something like 5% of companies were really focused on this. And only another 15% were giving it, you know, some kind of lip service, you know, which, which meant, you know, what, 80% 80, 80 of companies um, weren't, weren't doing anything around uh, innovation or experience design or design thinking, either because they weren't aware of it or they didn't see the value in it. So, um, and, you know, Jeff and I still kind of follow this and it's still about that way. When you think about um, experience makers or experience leaders, um, there's very few. Um, and there's lots of reasons why companies don't adopt this methodology. Um, but this is also why a lot of companies fail. I mean, it's, it's why, you know, Blockbuster failed. It's why, you know, Kodak, Kodak failed in, in some markets. It's why IBM failed in some markets. Right? They, they failed to innovate and to innovate requires discipline. It also, it, it requires a, a will from the top most member of the organization to make it happen. If leadership doesn't believe in this, it ain't gonna happen. Now, what you can do to sell it is talk about the return on investment um, in terms that they understand. Um, you can also do uh, you know, grassroots pilot projects you know, someone, someone somewhere has the product roadmap and that product roadmap um, hopefully goes, let's say it goes a year out. You can pick something that's gonna happen a year out and you can start doing the research for it now. And now you're a year ahead of whatever that thing is. You can do these skunk works to do things the right way. It just takes the willpower to do it. And if there's not the will to do it, then it isn't gonna happen. And I, you know, move on to a company that gets it. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Sean, John Stern. Again. Yeah. Hey, so like if we had a traditional system engineer role um, person and they wanted to move, they wanted to evolve into more uh, user design thinking, what's your, what's your recommendation for, uh, what's the top of your list for recommended reading? Um, I mean, other than my books, um, 
So for innovation, uh, again, Tim Brown's book, which uh, I can't remember the title of it, uh, but it has the word innovation in it. And it's by Tim Brown. And it's kind of the cornerstone of, of you know, how innovation is done. Um, I actually am a big component of the customer experience revolution. Um, it's used in universities around the world to teach uh, customer experience. Um, for the nuts and bolts, I'm going to recommend another one of my books, and that's Easy to Use 2.0, which is specifically about experience design in agile development for enterprise software companies. So it's very focused uh, for software companies that are following an agile process. And there's a whole chapter on design thinking and design sprints and how that fits in and where it belongs. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about innovation, design thinking? Yes, hi, can you hear me? I can hear you, Robbie. Oh, thanks. Um, how does design thinking work in this new remote work type scenario or setup now? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it works any differently than any other thing, <laughs> right? I mean, like things like prototyping and so on, it can't be done physically anymore. So. What are the tools now that are used to do that? Oh, you're talking about, so, um, well, so in software, well, no, no. So uh, you can still do remote testing. Remote testing predated the pandemic. Um, in fact, remote testing is a very fast way of getting things done. So um, if you, are we talking about software or hardware? Sorry, I wasn't being specific. Uh, let's say software. Software is super easy. So um, let's say you have some software you want to test. You can spin up a Zoom meeting like we're doing right now. You can send a, a link uh, to the prototype of that you want to test to the person you want to test it with. Um, and then you have them share your screen. Uh, and then you do the task analysis. Basically you say, oh, show me how you complete this task. And you observe them. You ask questions. Um, you conduct your study um, that way online. In fact, I've been doing that for 20 years. So it's it, it was pre-pandemic. You know, to kind of piggyback on Ravi's um, question, you know, one of the challenges that we've had just being remote as we've been trying to adopt some of these prototype or collabor collaboration tools to kind of gather ideas mm -hmm. and trying to do that virtually, you know, has been a challenge. I, I just feel like people just haven't sort of adapted to, okay, we bring up a mule board and now we're going to do some exercise that's going to kind of organize thoughts. And, you know, the idea of taking some sticky notes, sitting in a group, kind of working, and then going up to whiteboard and organizing that and translating that to something virtually. You're right, it can be done, but there has been, um, it feels like something's missing. Uh, some people just don't collaborate. You can't really see people and kind of get that reaction and, and kind yeah. of so things are a little off. Um, it can be done, but it, you know, it's a bit more difficult. Oh, I completely agree. 100%. I much, I much rather, uh, being a facilitator myself, I much rather be in the room, um, and be able to read people's body language and see their facial expressions and, uh, have that human connection, um, that, you know, makes it so special. Um, having gone from, running, you know, innovation workshops in a room with a bunch of people to running them online. One of the first things I realized was, first off, you're not going to cover as much ground. Um, keeping people's attention online is a fraction of what it's like if you're in front of them. So everything has to be much smaller chunks. Um, and the way that you share ideas has to be greatly simplified. Um, and because things have to be in smaller chunks and simplified, I agree, the data that you're gonna get isn't gonna be uh, as, as rich. Um, and it's, the only other thing is, I've also kind of done blended things where um, maybe um, you can do a remote group, right? And so some people can be in a remote group, a physical group, um, but then other ones can be a remote online group. Um, and you can sometimes blend the two um, and you'll get you know, better results. But to your point, Claude, it is always better when humans, for anything that you're doing, that humans can look each other in the eye and read each other's body language. That's always a better experience. Thank you.
This is Fiat. Uh, I really appreciated your comment about how we are to create a, a inclusive space, right? And when you're saying that it's not about differences of, um, you know, negating each other or, you know, saying, oh, I'm going to respectfully disagree or let's agree to disagree. I think that language is difficult when we're doing design thinking because um, the the inclusion part, right? It, it's, 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 it's missing. And I, and, and it's more than just something that's like, oh, this is why we need to do innovation. Um, you, you, I, I just wanted to highlight that point. And a lot of that for me is about being able to honor uh, different communication styles or even personality styles. Um, and, and I think that is kind of where the missing link is when we talk about you know, the, the need and then the, the approach, right? So Claude mentions like execution is the most difficult. And, and I think that block is because people aren't really honoring uh, how uh, each people communicate. So somebody in a group meeting uh, or in a group session, you know, group think is a, is a huge, um, is a huge barrier, right? And a lot of times uh, throughout, you know, someone's lifetime or experience, they may not want to share their idea because of, you know, whatever systemic barriers or even organizational uh, culture that, you know, creates ideas from, from being shared and welcome. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Um, it's something that I've observed. This is Viet, I'm done. Oh, yeah. Well, um, let me piggyback on that because that's really important to me. I, I actually did my grad work in multicultural uh, education. Um, and uh, it's amazing what we learn in education, but you know, one of the things that we learn in education is that, not surprising, uh, different people learn in different ways. And there's uh, a lot of really good uh, research and frameworks that have come out of Harvard Project Zero that has identified distinct different ways that people learn, visual, auditory. Um, there are people that learn interpersonal or expersonal. In other words, some people learn better as an individual or in groups. And one of the things about a good facilitator, a good facilitator um, should be aware that there are different learning styles, um, sometimes referred to as modalities of learning. Um, and when you're running a workshop, you should do ways that appeal to a variety of learning styles to um, help different learners um, feel comfortable the way that they learn. Um, and to me, it's also about you need to create an environment that is, uh, or there's a high level of trust and people feel safe and welcome to, you know, try their ideas. You know, sometimes the best ideas start out as the stupidest ideas. In fact, um, you know, having ran my share of innovations, sometimes it's, it's like, it's almost good to reverse it and say, okay, what do we think the worst idea is? And let's, and let's explore why that's a bad idea. And in the process of exploring what we think is a bad idea, that's somehow, that's a, that's a tool we can, which we can find a good idea. Or we might go down a path that we know that this isn't really the solution, but we'll, go, we'll still go down that path and we'll explore it. And there's some nut, there's some nugget in that path that's like, okay, we know that's not the right solution, but this bit here, this bit we're going to take back and we're going to run an experiment on it because that's something we wouldn't have thought about. So um, and you can only do that when you um, when you open up your mind and you uh, try you try things that you normally wouldn't try, and that's what experimentation and innovation is all about. Is thinking I hate the term thinking outside the box, but um, you know thinking differently, as Apple used to say. But that it only happens when you get a diverse group of people in the room that think differently about things and have a different perspective, and it's the blend of those ideas that innovation takes place. Hi, um, my name's Rebecca, and I just want to thank you for your presentation. It brought me down um, grad school lane again. <laughs> and I, I recently just got my graduate degree in design thinking, but I have 10 years of experience in consumer product and furniture design. And I'm trying to shift my career into UX research with staying in the design field, but I'm <clears throat> having difficulty 
finding places that have um, offer entry level positions. And I'm just curious if you have any recommendations on where I could begin that process because I've been working with um, my school, a lot of people trying to network on LinkedIn and just if there's any specific companies or anybody in the Los Angeles area that would be able to help. Um, are you interested in industrial design or software? What, what's your interest? Well, I, in my undergrad was industrial design. So right now I'm, I'm interested in user research. Mm -hmm. and Regardless I'm, if it's hardware or software? Um, it would be software. Okay. So um, it just so happens that uh, LA UX is the largest UX meetup group in the world. And it's yeah. something like over, I don't know, 3,000 members. Uh, and I don't know if they still meet, uh, have physical meetups, but when they used to have physical meetups, they'd have like 500 people show up at a meetup. I've spoken at that group, you know, more than once and was always impressed with the numbers. Um, if you're in the LA area, you can, you know, pretty much guess that a lot of the uh, business in that area is around uh, entertainment. Um, right. So there's studios, there's Disney, uh, yep. there's um, Blizzard, right, for gaming. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what you're going to find. I mean, that's just, you know, every town has its kind of thing, right? So uh, LA, when I think of LA, I think of, of uh, entertainment organizations. Um, and if that's where you're at, and hopefully that's what you like to do. Um, and if it's not what you like to do, then you might need to go to a different town. But uh, I would start with uh, LAUX. Again, it's the largest meetup in the world. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And you can link in with me. And uh, I, have a, I have a few connections that may be useful. I don't know. Okay, I will. And if you're open to any feedback or anything that I would much appreciate. Yeah, you can email me. Uh, well, here. You can um, email me. I'm I'm very responsive, or I try to be responsive. Wonderful. I'm happy to to you know find some time offline, have a virtual cup of coffee. Wonderful. Uh, Thank you. Help you out. Yay. This is my email. This is my company. Got um, it. This is my LinkedIn. Uh, any other questions? I have one quick question um, that may be a follow up uh, later. Um, how much would you say that peace building work uh, is used in in training uh, d design thinking or human centered design? Wow, that is an awesome question. Um, and very that's a very sophisticated question. And I bet most people don't even think about it that way, but uh, I say it's really important. And I think people who are um, good leaders, you know, and when I, when I say a good leader, that they see leader as service um, and um, are highly empathetic. Um, they understand that it, it is about, um, you know, brokering deals and negotiating um, and creating alliances and, getting on the same page. It's, it's actually empathizing. At the end of the day, it's empathizing. Empathizing uh, you know, with your colleagues, uh, empathizing with people in other departments, um, understanding what they value and be able to speak to them in the terms that they value so that you both can have a mutual uh, beneficial outcome. I think it's really important, especially yeah. now. Thank you for, for that. I, I ask because um, University of San Diego, they have their master's program in social innovation, which I participated in. And I found that um, the curriculum itself was definitely more in line with, um, you know, entrepreneurship and kind of like the business school. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I did find it interesting that it was under the, the Croc School of Peace Studies. And so a, a lot, you know, I'm an educator as well. So a lot of my program, I I wanted to gear towards like uh, innovation and education. And I, I came to kind of an, um, explore the peace building world, right? Like we're sort of justice circles, like have, you know, being able to 
facilitate space, um, and, you know, in, in conjunction with innovation. Uh, so I, I guess right now I'm still looking for that foot in the door uh, to kind of move from the educational realm into more of the corporate and, you know, organizational realm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why I'm asking these questions about like, how do we get this training, uh, you know, more accessible or even more attractive to, to those um, organizations that don't necessarily know how to pivot yet? Or, or yeah, don't even yeah I, I think HR is the key. So when I think about companies that have made this transformation. Um, at the end of the day, it, it came from HR. So again, I'm gonna use Intuit as an example. Um, when, they, when they introduced, um, so they had a whole program, I think it was called Innovation for Leaders, um, but the program was ran by and owned by the HR department. Um, but the innovators that ran the program, were they were in HR, but they were specifically working with with leaders in Intuit to teach the leaders um, design thinking so that they, they understood the mechanics of it. So I think HR uh, is kind of the key if you wanna change uh, an organization. And obviously HR is only gonna fund that and be a part of that if the executive team you know, thinks that's important. Another, another group in an organization, depending on how big the organization is, can also be the uh, training department. There's a lot of people that go from um, education into uh, uh, corporate training. Um, so corporate training and HR are the two places that I think that, you know, those are the places where you can make a difference in an organization.